Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. Here are your hosts, Trent Kling and Leighton Kling. Welcome to this edition of the Retail Focus Podcast with Trent and Leighton Kling. Lots of retail positivity on today's show. As we go into the off-price sector in our later news section, we'll also discuss Target as they blew away everyone's expectations, and we'll discuss department store retail with Kohl's. We're brought to you this week by MyEmma.com, powerful email marketing with a personal touch. Please give us a shout out and follow our Twitter and Instagram pages. On Instagram, we promote new and sometimes some iconic retail photographs when we come upon something that sparks our personal interest. Twitter and Instagram accounts both found at Retail Podcast. And of course, as always, thanks to all of our listeners out there. Please hit that subscribe button or rate us on whichever platform you do access us. The ratings always help out. And also another reminder, we're on YouTube every single week and you can subscribe to us there where our channel is simply Retail Focus. So we'll start this week with Target as their second quarter results showed exactly why the retailer not only has staying power, but why the recent run up of its share price may be more than justified. Same store sales and traffic were the points of interest from nearly every major headline covering Target's second quarter earnings release on Wednesday of this week. We'll get into how those important figures look, but first we must note the all-time highs that the share price has accomplished. Shares hitting over $88 at some points throughout the trading day, being up over 5%. Shares are up 28% year-to-date and over 53% for the 52-week time frame. The story for Target has largely been one of a strong turnaround because if you think back not too long ago, they had a massive data breach that Brian Cornell, their CEO, had to deal with. In addition, last year showed weakness in same-store sales, particularly in the grocery category where the company has been aggressively competing both in terms of pricing, but also merchandising and different produce initiatives to help reduce company shrink. And we've been talking about these initiatives on the podcast, but it has been slow to gain traction for the company. Some analysts scoffed at the idea of reinvesting millions of dollars while shutting down some even larger stores throughout the country that were underperforming, but everything looks to be taking hold now as the company seems to have correctly identified the right strategy for their vision, their long-term vision, and how it relates to a seamless integration of both digital and their physical stores. We are going to be talking about in this story the opening of several smaller format stores, again, further closures with the larger format stores, and how those multi-million dollar investments to make the retailer a fully omni-channel retailer have been paying off. But first, we look at this quarter's financials. At a glance, net income for Target hit $799 million, or $1.49 per share, compared with $671 million a year ago, or $121 a share. Excluding those pesky one-time items, Target earned $1.47 per share, or $0.07 ahead of analyst expectations. The adjusted mark was brought down by income tax matters, around $12 million worth to be exact. Regardless, that $1.47 per share beat Wall Street expectations by over 4.5%. Revenue for the company grew 7% overall, reaching $17.78 billion. Same store sales hit 4.9%, well above consensus marks. What they call comparable sales, which includes digital sales, ended up growing 6.5% hitting a 13-year high. That is a massive mark for the company and e-commerce sales. By the way, a major function of those comparable sales and revenue growth, those e-commerce sales grew by more than Walmart's latest quarter, percentage-wise at least, because obviously Walmart has significantly more sales in terms of the absolute dollar amount. For the second quarter, e-commerce sales for Target rose 41%. And by the way, this was on top of a 32% increase last year. So obviously they are hitting on all cylinders here. But you know what, Trent? Prime Day helped. As we said on an earlier podcast, businesses pay close attention to all of the online traffic that Amazon's Prime Day brings. Target, they played a part as well. Target ran their biggest sales day online ever in terms of sales, dollars, and traffic surrounding Prime Day. This was very interesting because... They were trying to capitalize on all of that traffic, and it worked to their benefit. It helped that their delivery service acquisition of Shipt had also been closed at that time as well. People had reportedly been pleased with the all-around service they got from the website. The website had no crashes. 
people were pleased with the shipped optionality. And by the way, they want the same day delivery option, Trent, to 65% of their existing markets by the end of this year or in time for the holiday season, in other words. And we talk a lot about price competition in addition to convenience competition, which Leighton just mentioned. And we talk about the price competition for good reason. Despite beating on earnings per share, Target's second quarter operating income margin rate was 6.4%. Now, this is down compared with 6.6% in 2017. And margin is something that we talk a lot about when it comes to general merchandise retailers because of the so-called price wars that have been going on for the last two years. Second quarter gross margin rate was 30.3, down a little bit compared with 30.4 in 2017. Now, a major cost for them was digital fulfillment, which we can assume came from their Prime Day counter sales initiative. They've admitted that they have more efficiencies and cost savings both to work out, but they're confident that customers will be the ones benefiting from streamlining more operations. And just like we saw with Walmart, Target's fleet has been a bit constrained due to driver wages and increasing fuel costs. The exact same thing that Walmart mentioned in their earnings call last week, Target mentioned in this earnings call this week, they're having trouble finding drivers due to wage inflation on that front. And also diesel fuel costs have gone up generally over last year. So the question really long term for Target is where can they get that profit back? Where can they get that margin back? And that's something that really we've talked about. Amazon hasn't really answered for Amazon's top line has grown and grown and grown. But we're not seeing that robust profit on the retail side for Amazon like what we've seen with the likes of Walmart and most of the time Target. Now, CEO Brian Cornell did make some remarks that also made headlines saying that the consumer environment is the best he has seen during his entire tenure in retail, not just his fairly short tenure to this point at Target. And in fact, he went on CNBC Wednesday morning and said that they're seeing overall a great consumer response with unprecedented traffic. And he also mentioned that they've never seen traffic growth like this. He said, and I quote, on any given day, 90% of retail sales are done in physical stores, end quote. And he said this to set up the making light of analysts that talked about physical retail being dead and a lot of the attention grabbing headlines, a lot of the clickbait headlines that if you followed retail, I'm sure you've seen regarding retail dying. And even for Target, keep in mind every move that Amazon made tanked Target's share price and decreased what a lot of analysts saw as a prospective future growth for Target, including Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods. But we've seen Target bounce back well. If you can call it bouncing back, I think we would say that Target has always been strong, regardless of the sentiment analysts have towards them. And one of the things that one particular analyst said, Jeffrey's analyst Randall Koenig said in a research note this week that the consumer is the strongest since 1999. And 1999, if you remember back that far, that was a time of really unprecedented growth in retail. There were a lot of other things going on during that time, certainly. And then we saw the dot-com bubble burst and consumer sentiment fall a little bit right after that. But one of the things that Koenig said in the research note is that companies are doing a better job of managing inventories, generally speaking, not necessarily the JCPenney's of the world, but digital investments for companies, he said, are paying off and real estate is being rationalized. And he also mentioned that Christmas will be much better than people think. Now, people already expect Christmas to be fairly good. We talked with Paul Walsh, weather expert with IBM last week. He said maybe temperature expectations based on weather, but still it's kind of a perfect storm here for Target as they've continued to grow, not only through the additions of a platform like Shipped, but also they've been able to grow organically in their physical stores. And I think it's refreshing to see for a lot of retail onlookers. A critical differentiator and core competency with Target is the ability to leverage their brand in smaller format stores. Again, something I had alluded to earlier, something we have been bullish on after visiting larger, more densely populated cities with smaller format Target stores. They've really been able to take advantage of areas that their competitors don't want to go in, namely the smaller retailers we tend to think of for the quick in and out purchases with CVS and Walgreens. So it is interesting to see that while they have 13 more stores total this quarter over last quarter they have roughly 500,000 square feet more of recognized selling space one would think that the 500,000 square feet more would be a little bit higher but it's because they've been rolling out those smaller format stores which actually reduce their average store footprint 
They have been aggressively following their plans to open 11 small format stores and did so this quarter or stores with roughly less than 50,000 square feet of space. Due to reconciling their store portfolio over the last couple of years, they actually have less selling space, but more total stores than they did during the same reporting period in 2017. So again, more stores, less space. They're trying to be as rational as possible here. They're trying to be as efficient as possible when you're looking at number of sales per square foot. We visited a store recently with only 65,000 square feet, so not quite a small format store by management's said definition here of 50,000 or less, but that store was extremely well laid out and was able to maintain proportionate category presence despite being a little bit more limited, a little bit more constrained because they were only 65,000 square feet in size. One of the cleanest stores, in my opinion, that I've been in, brighter lighting, clear signage, and these are all things that people have come to expect from a newer Target. Target should complete more than 1,100 store remodels through 2020. So we talk about multi-million dollar expenditures here. This is one of the things that they've been bullish on is those older stores that they aren't going to either relocate or close outright, they're going to be addressing in terms of remodels. The company is still opening about 30 new small format stores throughout the next year, many situated near college campuses. And again, that's going to be 30 new stores, but on an annualized basis. So expect this for the midterm at least. Finally, they also mentioned that they're building market share around what they call key life moments, a component of the fact that they feel as though their customers are talking about them a little bit more frequently. These gains in market share, according to Executive Vice President and Chief Merchandising Officer Mark Tritton on the call, took place around Mother's Day, Father's Day, Memorial Day, and July 4th for the quarter. And it's interesting because their marketing campaigns center almost entirely around the habitual consumer. You can look at examples, the Target Run campaign, not the key events consumer. And one of the other things that Tritton mentioned while on the call as the chief merchandising officer, he really delved into which categories were doing well. He mentioned, and this is interesting because just last week we talked about JCPenney struggling in this category, home being the standout category for Target, a comp of nearly 10%, and that was spurred on by decor and kitchen, among other categories. But in apparel, and this is something I found really interesting, they saw high teens growth in the baby sector, and they mentioned specifically on the call that they saw growth in not only baby but toys, and they referenced the fact that this was primarily because of the Babies R Us and Toys R Us closures, meaning that Target is gobbling up a lot of that market share that we see other companies, namely Walmart and the likes of JCPenney, trying to go after in the baby sector and in the toys sector as well. But that wasn't all. Here's the, perhaps the most interesting, at least from my perspective. Tritton said that food and beverage in particular delivered standout growth. Now remember, just a year ago, a little over a year ago in fact, Target was having a big issue with turnover in their produce section. They were having a big issue with turnover in some of their fresh goods, and it was causing them to have to lower price points, to have to clearance out goods. And one of the things that they have done, not only getting inventory in check, but they've been able to market their food and beverage a little bit better. We've talked in the past about their initiatives to move food and beverage more towards the front of the stores that have food and beverage that aren't super targets, and it seems to be working well for them. I don't think a year ago I would have expected us talking about food and beverage being an up category for Target because Target had shown demonstrated struggles in that particular area. So another reason to see potential growth from Target going forward now that they have that category a little bit more under control. Of course, they still see room for growth in food and beverage and also the essentials categories for them. Now, as far as the share price goes and as far as expectations go for Target, they did raise guidance for the full year. Target now expects adjusted earnings per share of between $5.30 and $5.50 for 2018, compared with a prior range of between $5.15 and $5.45 a share in fiscal 2018. So a small bump there in some cases, depending on which end of the lever you're looking at, less than 5%. But based off what we've seen with other retail earnings reports, we wouldn't be surprised to see them have an especially strong quarter three. Anecdotal evidence in particular 
points to Target having had a very strong back-to-school season, and that's likely built off of the fact that they're having success in some of these children's categories and some of the baby categories, although that affects back to school a little bit less in this last quarter. They're hoping to parlay that momentum into those strong back to school sales that'll show up on the ledger for the quarter that we're in and that we'll probably be talking about here three months from now. We keep rolling with more positivity and big retail, this time with Kohl's as they catch department store bears by surprise with a fantastic quarter. Kohl's came into the second quarter earnings call with a Zach's consensus expectation of $1.65 per share. For reference, earnings per share results came in at $1.76. Kohl's massive $292 million in profit was representative of an over 40% surge over last year. Their effective tax rate, by the way, was lower at around 24.5% thanks to tax reform. So that total absolute number of $292 million was brought on in large part by recently passed tax reform. Net margin surged to 6.3%, which is astounding for a mature apparel retailer. This is so interesting because they are primarily apparel-based. You usually see those margins a little less, especially with Kohl's, who has a massive amount of overhead And again, like I said, they're a mature retailer. They've been around for a while. You would expect net margins in around the 3 to 4% range, just like they had last year. Revenue grew a bit more modestly than profit, rising 4% to $4.57 billion. Same store sales grew 3.1%. Not a bad number. Not great if you compare them directly to a competitor in Target, which obviously outpaced that number, but it was over the 2.7% same store sales expectation that was brought forth by analysts. This is actually, for reference, the fourth straight quarter of positive comp for the company i am curious to see how long they were able to keep that streak alive we look through the notes from the earnings call the staple brands like nike under armor adidas all performed very well for the company the ceo said on the earnings conference call that the in-house labels like apartment nine and lc lauren conrad did very well as well their apartment nine selection is actually pretty impressive i was recently in a kohl's i was actually in every single retailer recently that we will be talking about on this podcast but for kohl's i was extremely excited to peruse their sections apartment nine has a massive influence on their dress clothing and promoting more modern fitting suits and dress shirts that are really popular with a younger generation. You see a lot of people going through those aisles. And to be honest with you, Trent, this is something that Kohl's has been pushing for quite some time. They don't want to remain stale, especially with these niche categories that a lot of new up and coming e-commerce retailers are trying to take advantage of. They also have partnered, by the way, with Nine West, an apparel brand that will be featured on their website in 2019. We're going to be talking about another partnership later on in this story. The Amazon partnership, speaking of partnerships, has management extremely pleased. Not only are they selling some Amazon devices in store, but they, like we talked about on a recent podcast, are piloting Amazon return programs in a handful of stores. It's unclear if there's actually a substantial traffic bump because of these partnership programs. But we doubt that it harms them, certainly. Any more traffic to their stores could in turn result in another sale of their merchandise. So something to think about for the long term. However, on the conference call, there was just CEO Michelle Goss and CFO Bruce Basenko. And Goss has been with the company for a total of five years. And according to an interview with former CEO Kevin Mansell, back at the end of last year, he personally thought that hiring her was an out-of-a-box hire and Most of her high-level experience actually came from Starbucks. So Goss has a strategy that is one of openness and constant transformation, which is perfect for the current digital landscape that Kohl's is trying to kind of come in on. In that vein, she spoke on the conference call of how innovation can and will funnel long-term sustainable growth. Now, profitability is one of Goss's focal points, and we see that driving costs down and the aggressive inventory reduction helps second quarter's gross margins improve 42 basis points. But also, this affects how they look at their innovative strategies. Even though the Amazon affiliation has been positive, Goss did remind analysts on the call that the basic financial fundamentals still have to work for the company. And also, she reminded them that understanding the overall impact will dictate their future relationship with Amazon. Kind of what Leighton was referencing earlier, 
We don't know whether or not their Amazon partnership is positively affecting traffic, but you can bet that Kohl's does. And the continuation of this partnership and determining how this partnership will continue is based off of those numbers and those results. And yet again, on the call, we hear about inventory levels. This was a huge point. It was mentioned a couple of different times on the call. Inventory decreased for the 10th straight quarter, down 8% year over year for this latest reporting quarter. And this will, of course, help them with their efforts to reduce square footage and also lease out some of their real estate holdings in selective markets. They have some key strategies, too, that they feel like will help the customer experience and drive the bottom line. One is to identify local market trends to carry the right selections. This is interesting to hear this even mentioned on the call because I think this is something that we assume a lot of retailers do, but Goss feels like Kohl's has room for growth in this space. Also, Goss mentioned being careful not to get too much inventory to the stores while at the same time fully utilizing the sales floor space, meaning that people not only feel comfortable moving and walking through the sales floor, but also they're using that sales floor space in a creative way. Creativity, something that we've heard a lot of from Kohl's over the past couple of quarters. They're also talking about merchandising items better and putting energy behind marketing campaigns regarding their new merchandising. A clear example of making room for something that's been increasingly catching the eye of all retailers is back to school items and for Kohl's this extended into jeans and these were subject to an aggressive marketing campaign and again not to beat a dead horse but when we were talking to Paul Walsh last week he mentioned it's going to be a cooler back to school year meaning jeans will be at the forefront for a retailer like Kohl's. Private label brands too were reportedly the healthiest in over five years and Goss mentioned actually continued momentum in Kohl's as a national brand as a whole more people realizing Kohl's just above and beyond the department store you drive by and recognizing it as a crucial and important retailer for not only seasons like back to school but other needs as well not only in fashion but in other departments and she mentioned this in turn resulted in the private label strength that Kohl's saw during this last quarter. Again, tying marketing in with in-store merchandising, but also being diligent and making sure there's plenty of inventory for the most sought after goods were keys for them in this category. And for them, speed equals value. The exact same methodology that we see in the direct to consumer environment kind of was borne out for Kohl's. All said though, as we break it down into categories, the stronger categories proved to be women's, men's, and children's. That's basically everything they have, which they did acknowledge. Now, you can mention home and decor in some of those areas that weren't explicitly talked about on the earnings call as super successful categories. Women's apparel in particular stood out for them as it outperformed total average comps for the first time in nearly seven quarters. And in addition to that Nine West rollout Leighton talked about, in September, they're putting out a proprietary brand, Pop Sugar, which is actually kind of the name of a clickbait website as well. But this will carry more than women's apparel, more accessories. As we know, that's currently a tough space to compete in, and JCPenney struggled in accessories this last quarter. Kohl's feels like there's areas for growth there, certainly. And fluctuating margins, micro trends, and shrink all being associated with that accessory subcategory historically, but Kohl's feels like they can leverage their success in women's and children's into success in those accessories. Company echoes our sentiments, at least, about the short to midterm performance. They did so in the way of revised guidance, which is going to be a theme for this podcast. Like with Target, Kohl's raised full year earnings per share guidance, now between 496 and 536 a share, compared with the prior range that they gave between 486 and 531 a share. So a little bit of bump on the bottom and top end of that earnings per share range. Shares of Kohl's, ticker KSS, are bumping up against all-time highs, just like with Target. They ended up around $81 per share on Friday, $80.86 to be exact, carrying momentum from the beginning of the year where shares started off around $55. So quite the run-up for them. Current market cap of $13.5 billion. By the way, this was a company last year we were talking about had over a 4% dividend yield. Because that share price is increasing, that dividend yield has shrunk due to the latest run-up, but is still a respectable 3.02%. 
And one other quick note on Kohl's. They did mention in July they launched Buy Online Ship to Store available in 20 stores. But something to watch for on ensuing earnings calls is the fact that this is going to be rolled out to all stores, they say, within the next few months. This is something that oftentimes we see other department stores have. Kohl's has been a little bit behind in this particular category and they feel like this is going to create more of that omni-channel environment that Kohl's is so keen on and they feel like it's going to increase the assortment available to their customers for free pickup in the store so again buy online ship to store platform for Kohl's being rolled out over the next couple of months just something to keep in mind Maybe not for next earnings call, but because they're not going to see impacts from that completely by the time they come out with their next earnings call. But certainly by quarter four, something to keep an eye on for the large department store retailer. Well, coming up, we're going to talk to representatives from Publicis.Sapient and Salesforce as they collaborated on a massive retail report that came out just last week. Now, here's some advice for anyone that sends emails to their customers. And I know if you're an e-commerce retailer out there, if you're any kind of retailer out there, this probably includes you. You know what? You deserve a better email marketing platform, one that's actually designed with your type of organization in mind. And unlike other email providers, Emma puts its customers first, offering powerful email marketing with a personal touch. With Emma, you'll have everything you need to connect your data, build your audience, and do your most successful marketing ever. Because their easy-to-use platform makes advanced functionality accessible to everyone on your team with no technical skills required. You can even connect Emma with the services you count on to run your business every day like Salesforce and Google Analytics. Not to mention, Emma's award-winning team is always ready to support you on your email marketing strategy, design, list migration, and more. So put the power of email experts behind your marketing. Request a customized demo of Emma's email marketing platform today at myemma.com. Again, that's myemma.com. As longtime Retail Focus podcast listeners know, we love data. More importantly, we love delving into data about retail, whether that be shopper habits, how weather affects retail, as we talked about last week, or otherwise. Salesforce and Publicis.Sapient recently teamed up to produce the Shopper First Retailing Report, and there's lots of interesting findings within, as there were in last year's report. Here to talk to us about it are Rick Kenny, Head of Consumer Insights with Salesforce, and Hilding Anderson, Head of Strategy for Retail North America for Publicis.Sapient. Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, guys. Thanks so much. Good to be here. So this report that came out this year, I was wondering if you could kind of walk us through the methods, how the data was collected, that sort of thing. Absolutely. You know, I'd be happy to. This is Rick. You know, for a long time, folks have been beating up on retail. And, you know, for, for good measure in a lot of ways, we've seen, you know, 12,000 store closures in the U.S. alone the past 18 months. We've seen that while there's great digital growth, Amazon is, is really capturing about 78% of all that growth. So what we wanted to do was really get at what's working, what can a brand or retailer do to compete alongside and inside of this new retail climate. So we took a unique approach. We looked at a three-dimensional data set. First, we want to look at shopping activity and where we need to bolster that with some shopping preferences. We did some surveying. And then third, we actually want to look through the eyes of the shopper and, and conduct a mystery shopping exercise. So I want to get into that first bit on the shopping activity. So when we look at shopping activity, we see the true story of shopping today, looking at the clicks and taps of half a billion shoppers across Salesforce, Commerce Cloud. And inside that, we see change pace of that change, and really the key trends that are driving retail forward. Also this year, we looked at how shoppers are engaging with customer service. So looking across Salesforce Service Cloud, you know, how do they create cases, when do they use a knowledge base or an FAQ, for instance, and really through that shopping activity data, we see a true story of shopping. We need the 6,000-person consumer survey across six global markets. 
for the surveying and then for that mystery shopping we did 80 stores across the globe so london new york and san francisco and again look through the eyes of the shopper and now let's get to some of the findings here every year it seems like any new study that comes out there are interesting findings that maybe surprise the researchers a little bit were there findings like that in this circumstance yeah, I would say there are kind of four foundational findings, if you don't mind me taking this one, Rick. It's, you know, we believe there are kind of four foundational findings, what we call the retail truths. I mean, the first is around mobile. You know, we know today that, you know, close to 60% of all digital traffic is happening on the mobile device, and the phone accounts for essentially all digital growth, which is, you know, accounting for essentially all of the retail revenue growth today, certainly in North America. The second is around the role of intelligence. Personalization, in our research, we found that it is influencing 37% of all digital revenue, despite only going for about 7% of all traffic. So we know that personalization and the role of AI and ML is having a, a huge impact on the revenue in the digital space. We also found the third kind of key foundational truth was around the role of the store. We believe that the store is a major engagement point, of course, for, for most retailers. It's, you know, 70 plus percent of total revenues. In our study, we found that 46 percent of shoppers actually prefer to shop in the four walls of the store. And we're seeing a lot of activity around rethinking the and building the store of the future, a store not just digitally enabled, but really seamlessly connected to the journey of the shopper. And then finally, the you know final pieces around connected experiences. So building the kind of connected experiences. No surprise, shoppers you know don't draw a line between devices, channels, and points of sale. And it's abundantly clear that you know in our study, 83% of shoppers are using their phones while within the four walls of the store. I'm kind of curious. You mentioned the massive amount of growth in the mobile space. In your findings. Were you finding that this is more because retailers are focusing on it more, making that experience on mobile a little bit easier for the customer to navigate, or is it simply because customers are relying on their phones a little bit more? Is it a mixture of both? Yeah, I think you hit it. And you know, what's really fascinating about what's happening with mobile is that the migration of shoppers from things like a computer or, you know, for those that are still hanging on to tablets, there are many of those, but folks who were on tablets, moving to phone is just massive. And so this mobile migration that we're seeing continues its momentum every single quarter. In fact, he'll be mentioned that we're at 60% of all traffic is from a phone right now. That's up 21% year over year. We don't see an end in near sight at this point either. Last Christmas, we saw 68% all traffic on a phone. And you know, for the first time ever, we saw 50% of orders placed on a phone as well. So really, shoppers are, are choosing the device to use, and, and increasingly that phone where for some brands and retailers with a younger demo, they're, they're looking at 75% of traffic already coming from a phone. On the retailer side, we're, we're starting to see some innovation, we're starting to see folks adopt better best practices around mobile shopping. But honestly, we, we think there's a, a lot more innovation left, especially with what Hildy mentioned. 83% of folks are using their phones while in a store, there aren't a lot of great stories yet of folks that are actually doing something interesting on their phone while on the shopper's phone while in a store. There's one really great story coming out of the retailer Stance Stock. So if you're unfamiliar with Stance, they make a great stock, really you know, high fashion, great quality stock. There's some other items now as well. But what Stance did, which I think fits the, you know, the approach of shopper first, is they recently launched in-store self-checkout on your own phone, no app required. And we love that story because it's finding friction inside of the shopping experience and just eliminating it right off, right? There will not be a line for you in a fan store because you can just check out on your own with no need from an associate to come and help you to do that. And that's the sign of great innovation happening in a store but on someone's phones. We're starting to see that. You know, taking advantage of the clear path to more traffic on a phone from the shopper and retailers starting to respond to it. I would also say from a retailer perspective, there's significant investment going on, and, and I would I would highlight a couple different areas. The first is kind of this broader trend around the use of data and personalization to build, and that's so important on a compact device like the phone, and it allows you between location data as well as you know kind of personalization and previous shopping patterns. 
for a retailer to really create a very, very custom one-to-one marketing type of experience using the data. If, and we're seeing a lot of activity around retailers using that machine learning and AI to, to do that, to not only make it a one-to-one experience there, but to actually do retargeting and a number of other kind of components to make it just a fantastic experience for shoppers. The second kind of area that we're seeing is, is a lot of activity around enabling mobile payment and using that to reduce the friction so that you can actually get to and through the checkout process in the couple minute window that you do have on that mobile device. And then we're also seeing some exploration, although not much kind of in market yet around voice. So using voice and, and voice control to actually change and engage with some of these retailers is definitely an experimentation type of mode there. But mobile, there's no question that mobile is a big part of the story. It has been for a couple of years. We're, we're anticipating it, it to continue to grow through this holiday season and beyond. You mentioned the example there of the checkout on your phone without downloading an app able to remove friction in that physical store. And I know, Hilding, you talked earlier about customers still preferring to shop in the physical store, retailers trying to figure out what that store of tomorrow looks like. What are some of the retailers from your study doing to kind of implement this idea of this store of the future where you take out so much of that friction that exists in the current retail setting? We did some mystery shopping across 70-plus retailers, I think the study has 70 in there, and we looked at London, New York, and Chicago. And one of the highlights, you know, we have, I think we share about 10 of the top stores that we visited. One of the highlights for me, and and Rick, I'd welcome your thoughts too, is the Nordstrom Men's Store in, in New York where they have, you know, just completely redesigned the store from the ground up was, was our kind of our leading category and really touched on a couple of the what we call shopper first mandates, which are the what we think really is the kind of key competitive levers that retailers can pull to compete against the marketplaces and the brands. And we'll get into that in just a second. But what the Nordstrom store did is a couple different things. One is really enable that kind of omni-channel experience. They offer 24-hour self-service return kiosks. They have a dedicated click-and-collect space, so really making it easy for you to engage as a shopper and, and pick up your orders at any time or return those orders at any time, which, as we know, you know consumers are doing more than, than maybe they ever have before. They also have a number of different experiential components, so things like an on-site barber shop and a speakeasy actually within the store itself, creating some reasons for, for people to go and, and creating some loyalty and engagement with those shoppers when they're inside the four walls of the store. So, you know, for me, that was a really interesting one that came up in our mystery shopping study. Yeah, that add one, which is Adidas, and Adidas does a great job of really bringing the physical store together with both the digital environment, but also some great engagement opportunities, you know, their, their customization, their customized gear is certainly on display and something you can customize while in-store on their devices as well. But also they do things like like check your gate, they'll get your, your actual, uh, get you in the right running shoe or the right footwear that's going to fit for you. And I think with those, we start to see this real confluence of the great physical environment it's also a point of engagement for the shopper that's on their phone might want to use if they have the Adidas app downloaded to use that for kind of an augmented approach as well. So it's just a really great innovation from the folks at Adidas. Building on that, I think we've got these four retail truths when we talk about Nordstrom and, uh, and Adidas. But I think where the real power of the study lies is around you know, thinking through the difference between marketplaces, brands, and retailers. Because one of so much of the conversation that we're seeing right now is that retail is at – kind of under this real pressure and that we're seeing, you know, significant pressure from the brands, marketplaces and retailers as well as from uh, new startups that are coming in as well as from some fundamental changes in technology like robotics and IoT and and some of these other ones. You know, Rick, do you want to talk briefly about, you know, some of the findings in the study around brands, marketplaces and retailers? Yeah, I'd love to. And and like you mentioned, there there are real challenges out there today and and Amazon is on every brand and retailers lunch because they're doing such great things but also have a massive impact on the consumer. One of the things that we ask shoppers is, you know, why do you choose to go to either a brand or a retailer or a marketplace? And they answered differently for each place, which I thought was really unique. And, and in particular, what we saw is that if it came to price or convenience or just easy access to products in the marketplace is one, that didn't come as a surprise. We also saw, though, on the other side, the emergence of what we look at as the brand advantage. And if it came to product, if it came to finding genuine, authentic innovation and just having unique products, that the brands were winning. Shopper 
what you're comfortable going directly to the brands at this point in the retail climate. And what we see that's really interesting is if on one side that marketplace is owning and really dominating with price and convenience, and on the other side, brands are dominating when it comes to the product, the folks that are getting squeezed out are the legacy retailers, the folks that generally would or previously had been the leaders in retailing are now challenged because these newer business models, those these young upstarts on some of the brands or certainly the, the behemoth um, folks in the marketplace side, retailers are challenged. In fact, the only reason that shoppers chose to go first to retailers is for customer service. And what's interesting is you look at the legacy retailers that have either fallen behind or fallen off the path entirely towards bankruptcy or for another means, we see that those are folks who haven't differentiated on customer service, while the folks that have the REIs in the world, the Stitch Fixes or even Nordstrom, those folks do differentiate on service. And we see that that is a winning strategy for retailers, while brands can dominate with products, marketplaces can drop, dominate with ubiquity and access. Retailers still do have a place, but they can't lose sight of what's happening with customer service. And part of that service equation is that personalization and data component, you know, knowing who your customer is and being able to deliver the right products at the right time for them. You know, another part is, I think, you know, one of the findings in our study is around loyalty. So, you know, nine out of ten of our top scoring brands had clear evidence of a loyalty program in our study. Sixty-six percent of shoppers in our research say they're more likely to buy from brands and retailers that offer a loyalty program. And for us, that becomes, again, a key opportunity for retailers to differentiate and to build and, and connect with their customers. Because a modern loyalty program today really isn't about the points. It's not about a, a transaction or an exchange. It's really about a sense of belonging, a sense of participation. Because we believe, I guess, that, that great loyalty programs are all about a brand relationship that the customer wants to bring into their everyday life. You can't force someone on it. You can't pay them to do be part of the brand. It's got to be something that they want to participate in. And that's where you, know, you look at the great programs and the great brands that are able to do this. Again, the REI, but, but also the Sephora, you know, people want to have that be part of, uh, part of their lives. And they, they see value uh, both financially, but also kind of emotionally from some of these brands. That kind of gets us into the kind of key shopper first mandates. There are three of them. Make it fresh, be where I am, and give it meaning. You know, make it fresh is really interesting because we see strong evidence of the impact that fast fashion has had on all of retail. Uh, and we see it from shopper preferences that they expect 69% of folks expect to see new merchandise, whether it's visiting a store or logging in to see a site. So fresh and fast kind of go together but also the requirements and opportunities for brands to actually bring unique products to light. And we get this strong preference that shoppers will go after those customized products. 59% of folks are more likely to buy from brands and retailers that offer, offer customized products. We're seeing all this strong evidence, you know, alongside some really interesting, interesting things that are happening in terms of how fast products are moving through. You know, we found that 75% of site searches are new month over month. So there's just a constant newness. The shoppers are looking for something new all the time. And really, that's the new mandate for retailers is to make it fresh. You know, we also found in the kind of be where I am, designing the stores from the ground up for a digital world where you're entirely connected. So you've got to evolve the store. You've got to optimize and connect the mobile journey. We know that 82% of shoppers are willing to have their products shipped to home within 24 hours if the store doesn't have it. So if you're able to move fast and you're able to get people their products in, in time within those 24 hours, you're still going to be able to get that sale. And that kind of omnichannel piece also lets you compete with the marketplaces because you have a physical space where people can actually try and engage with those products and touch and feel and, and experience the brand in a way that you, know, you just can't through a lot of the digital channels today. Right on. And the first and final shopper first mandate, you say give it meaning, and the it is about the relationship that the brand has with the shopper. And certainly at times that can mean things like value-based retailing or showing that you stand for something and connecting with a shopper. And that, we see evidence that there is interest in the shopper that they want to actually sequence a brand or retailer that does stand for something. Maybe most importantly, though, one of the ways you can give that relationship meaning to the one is loyalty, helping to get on loyalty, important there, 
but also in, in showing that you actually know the shopper. You know, we still see numbers. This year's number was 64% of shoppers say a retailer doesn't really know them. Well, one fantastic way to do that is to actually employ artificial intelligence and personalization to actually show and prove tangibly that you do know the shopper. What we saw from that, which is astounding, is that while 6% of, of shoppers will click or tap on a recommendation, that group of shoppers, that 6%, drives 37% of digital revenue. So if you are able to prove that you know the shopper and do so through relevant content and personalization, then you will find your best shoppers. That's how to best connect shopper and product. And that's really the great example of giving it meaning, but it being the relationship between the shopper and the brand. And we saw this in our study in the mystery shopping. Nine out of the ten top scoring brands had above average score in that emotional in the given given meaning component of the, of the score. So we're really seeing that with our with the leading brands. All right, guys, good stuff. Rick Kenny and Hilding Anderson. Once again, check it out. Shopper first retailing report. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Retail Focus Podcast. <music> And for more on that 2018 Shopper First Retailing Report that Rick and Hilding were discussing, you can visit sforce.co slash retail focus. That's sforce.co slash retail focus. Well, we turn on in the retail focus this block all about off price. It's the tale of two off price stores this week as both TJX and Tuesday morning released earnings on Tuesday. And as you might guess, one did a little bit better than the other. And you might guess that because it was TJX that made nearly every headline late in the week. Analyst estimates heading into the calls had TJX earning $1.05 per share and a loss of 29 cents per share expected for Tuesday morning. Granted, even if that loss of 29 cents had come true, and we'll talk about where they came in later on, it would have been better than last year's loss of 39 cents in the same quarter for the beleaguered or off-beleaguered, off-price retailer. Maybe not as beleaguered as you might think this quarter, which we'll talk about. You know, Tuesday morning in Steinmart, pretty much the only two off-price retailers that have struggled in this current climate over the past three to four years, while others, such as TJX, Ross and Burlington, which we don't often talk about on the podcast, have surged over the past three plus years. And that surge continued for TJX, the parent company of TJ Maxx, Home Goods, and Marshalls, reported earnings on Tuesday morning, and they simply blew away all financial expectations for their second quarter. Earnings per share were already expected to rise 23%. But they came in far better at $1.17 per share. Remember, I mentioned analyst expectations were $1.05 per share. Revenue beat estimates by $300 million. Not $3 million, not $30 million. You heard me right. Revenue beat analyst expectations by $300 million. Those are consensus expectations, too. Within that, store comps increased a whopping 6% as people made purchases at all of their subsidiaries, not only the ones I mentioned, but also Sierra Trading Post, which is slowly growing as well. This increase in comps was driven primarily as a function of traffic, not so much ticket growth. So more people going into their stores. And for MarMax and TJ Maxx in particular, traffic was up for the 16th consecutive quarter. MarMax seeing the biggest boost, followed by their Canadian operations. CEO Ernie Herman was quoted as saying that a significant share of new customers are actually younger customers. And this speaks to some future staying power for TJX. If millennials are forming good opinions about the retailer and even those younger than millennials are forming good opinions about the retailer at such an early point in their lives a reminder that sometimes we think of millennials as younger customers there are millennials into their 30s at this point now given that older generations still like to frequent marmax again based on data they appear to be reaching multiple different subsets of the population and this is not something that a lot of retailers can do it is unique what they've been able to accomplish thus far. They are labeling their marketing as multi-layered, their strategy in which we take to mean taking place on multiple platforms to keep a relevant message to younger consumers that may be new to the brand. Fitting into the strategy is the loyalty program outlay, which drives more frequent visits for most retailers. We talk about Ollie's Bargain Outlet and how they keep track of how much more frequent those customers that are part of the Ollie's Army program frequent their stores. TJX not being an exception here. So they are seeing that higher membership equals higher traffic. 
per their loyalty program. They have made critical Gen Z sightings, which of course is the generation that is post-millennial. The official Wikipedia definition, as we look this up, has a Generation Z or being born on or after 1993. Canada, for those who care, widely regard Generation Z representing those born between 1995 and 2015. So these are individuals who are fairly young. Many of these individuals still in high school, middle school. This all seems entirely arbitrary and borderline pointless as labels merely end up as buzzwords for analysts longer term. But one thing not mentioned throughout the earnings call remarks was their continued focus on the in-store experience for all demographics that goes beyond what they carry and how they are going to get public perceptions changed via different marketing techniques. Stores, at least in our experience, are much cleaner and much more structured than they were, say, five years ago. And this is because of management's execution. They realize their faults and they have addressed them consistently and they've stayed on with that messaging. And they seem to continue to get better with time, which goes a long way in this environment as we see with the likes of Target because of Target's consistency. Their public perception that their stores are going to be clean and organized when you go in them goes a long, long way. Some people are even fine with paying a little bit more per item, per like item, because of that cleanliness. One disappointment for their CFO in particular seems to be how gross margins didn't fare too well for them. Freight costs were a main driver in this particular facet. It is as though nobody planned for this, and this is interesting to us because freight investments should have been taking up a lot of their expenditures for this period of time where you see extremely low or relatively low fuel prices it is just like those, in our opinion, those SUV and truck buyers now expecting low prices at the pump in perpetuity. It's just not going to be the reality. And for them, for every single brick and mortar retailer, for every e-commerce retailer even, it is all about those freight costs. Drivers are having higher wages. Fuel costs are going up. Similar gripe to Walmart's recent response this last week with rising fuel costs. They should have seen this coming. And they simply are just acknowledging that it's happening now, but don't really have a response. So for the long term, I would love to see them address this particular issue with some other investments, maybe having a renewable fleet for their trucks, but other expenses in the quarter that were related to their ongoing investments were new store openings, IT investment, which is ongoing in a sizable capacity, by the way and supply chain expenditures overall. Here it is easy to think that supply chain issues being directly associated with new store openings is what's bringing that cost up. Not those existing markets, but entirely new areas for the company where they have to extend that fleet out into new areas. So it's going to be a little less efficient because you're not used to having that particular hub in terms of distribution. Theme for this podcast, Trent, positively revised earnings per share guidance. You're right, Leighton. That does seem to be the theme. TJX actually raised theirs slightly from 475 to 483 per share to 483 to 488 per share. So they narrowed the range, but also bumped everything up slightly. They basically made the top end of their old range their new bottom end as a result of not only this quarter, but what they're seeing so far from the next quarter. Shares of TJX had already pushed up more than 30% for the year-to-date period, and they added another 5% to market value after the second quarter beat and subsequent details. Now, you may have forgotten because we spent a lot of time on TJX, but this off-price retail story is about one success and one that is lagging just a little bit behind. And Tuesday morning, of course, the retailer that is lagging had a narrower net loss than expected in their fiscal fourth quarter. And that means for the full fiscal year, they were able to squeeze out an extremely modest profit of $21.9 million dollars. That is huge for a company that we have seen negative earnings per share time and again over the last three years. And as a result, shares have followed that. They've skyrocketed more than 80% over a year's time, thanks in part to that profitable stance. Quarterly revenue hit $230 million, while full-year revenue surpassed the $1 billion mark by $10 million. This marks a first for the 45-year-old retailer. That's right. Even when they had more stores, and we'll talk about that in a second, they didn't surpass that $1 billion mark for the full fiscal year. This being their fourth quarter, they just peaked above that $1 billion mark. CEO Stephen Becker said he was thrilled with his company's achievements, especially the store comps. And what's very important to note here and remind everyone of 
And certainly this was brought up multiple times during management's time with analysts at the end of the earnings call was the fact that their physical store rationalization plan is now starting to bear fruit. I mentioned the fact that they used to have more physical locations, 860 stores a few years ago, now down to just 719 yet they're achieving all-time highs in revenue. Now, we should keep in mind that it isn't all about store closures either. A lot of times you hear companies start a store rationalization plan. This just means wholesale closures, kind of like Sears Holdings, what we've seen with them, or even with the Cena Retail Group. But for Tuesday morning, they've retained a consistent store opening schedule, and they see more store openings over the next year and a half. They've had recent openings in Oklahoma, Texas, and Minnesota, more openings on tap including in Florida for this upcoming quarter. And so you've got a situation here where stores are being closed, but there are several being added and several actually being moved. The real estate is being changed now and the store portfolio is being truly reimagined. It's not just a matter of closing stores for Tuesday morning right now, which is a positive for the chain. And Tuesday morning continues to hunt out new neighborhoods and new markets that may be uncovered by other off-price retailers, in particular by TJX and their subsidiary Home Goods, And we feel as though this program, as much as anything, has contributed towards the slight upturn towards profitability for the company. And Leighton talked about Stephen Becker being thrilled with the comps. Third and fourth quarter combined store comps hit 5.6%. That's a function of 3.6% higher transaction volume and almost a 2% growth in average basket value. Now, there's a reason... We lump those two quarters together. Leighton, what is it? This was with the, actually the fourth quarter being negatively hit with an Easter shift, which has caused sales around that holiday to be recorded in the third quarter. So it's very important on a comp basis to compare these two quarters and to look at those effects historically because of the Easter shift. Numbers this quarter for all comp stores came in around 2.4%, still well ahead of inflation for general merchandise. The company's store comparisons includes stores that have been moved to upgraded locations. So those stores that have been relocated here in the recent past, we found it refreshing to see how these numbers have been broken down for everyone on the call. So the stores that have not moved and have been open for at least 12 months perform not as well as the average comp. And that totally makes sense because if you think about it, newer locations, locations that were curated by management over a period of time, those newer locations are spurring up sales and traffic. Conventional store comps, those stores that have been open at least 12 months that have not been relocated, taking out those newer relocated stores hit 2.1% in terms of store comps. Still a fairly strong number for the company. Keeping inventory in check was crucial and has been a longtime priority for the company that some investors have actually grown impatient with because their initiatives have taken time to take hold. For this latest quarter, less inventory meant they were able to bring in newer items and replenish a little bit faster than usual, which in turn resulted in a 12% higher inventory turn rate of 2.8 times in the fourth quarter. Fairly impressive for Tuesday morning. By the by, the more aggressive markdowns have helped to kick out stale inventory. Again, it's all about replenishment. If you can kick out that stale inventory, that means you can hurry up and replace it with something that's a little more trendier, a little bit better for your common consumer. Something we talked about last week with JCPenney, but it seems as though Tuesday morning's replacement goods are performing a tad better than JCPenney's. Their inventory system and their strategy seems to be working hand in hand with their supply chain investment. So it's all working seamlessly. So this replenishment, this quicker turn of inventory has to do also with their supply chain initiatives. Everything has to work together in order for it to work and help with gross margins. Trucking, by the way, is said to be a challenge. Ways of creating even more efficiency is said to be ongoing. However, little details, very little details as to how they're going to reduce expenditures in terms of freight costs. Clearancing is one thing. Regular sales and promotions are another. So you're wanting to clearance out merchandise that is stale. It's been on the shelf too long. Sales, Tuesday morning is known for sales. With sales, the company is actually been going with a strategy to have less sales for the long term. Be a little more deliberate as to the timing of their sales 
and their promotional strategy. Historically, the company has explained that they would have sales about once a month, but this has become way too routine for their common customer. Customers, they know when the sales are going to happen, so they try to take advantage of that. And of course, that's going to hurt gross margins for the long term. They want to reduce this number of sales. They don't want sales every month anymore. Presumably because, like I was alluding to, loyal customers may be too used to this and take advantage of this. And this is always a game of acceleration of traffic versus the cost of merchandise margin. So obviously you're going to have higher traffic levels the more sales and promotion you have. But it's going to come at a cost of long-term margins and public perception. One thing that has been mentioned in passing on recent earnings calls is their branding efforts as they embrace a new mark and color scheme and trend. This is something that the company has been dabbling with, but analysts often overlook this aspect for these companies. Absolutely. It is crucial to the branding of a retailer, especially one attempting to reinvent itself through upgraded and revamped locations as Tuesday morning is doing. The prior logo for Tuesday morning looked almost generic, almost as though they weren't even a massive store chain, like it was almost a local store. Now their logo is more consistent across their store chain and their website, which, by the way, their website also massively improved over the last year. The newer light blue logo has a bit of a busy font, so don't necessarily like that, but it's at least more recognizable than their plain all caps aerial type font, oftentimes in red, that would adorn stores in the past. Now, not all locations have completely undergone the re-imaging with the logo, but a substantial amount have, particularly in Texas, where the chain is based, and also the Mountain West. Email marketing, by the way, is going well, although no mention on the call of social media spend, which Honestly, we are constantly disappointed and we feel like more retailers should be doing more on social media, particularly in the off-price space. Now let's talk briefly about real estate. Well, they have less of a store count. They are concerned about the pace of lease rates going forward. We found this an interesting addition to the call, particularly for a retailer that is both closing and opening stores at the same time, trying to basically reimagine their entire retail fleet. However, and this is a big however, they have been forthright in their lease negotiation. A whopping 40% of their leases are coming due in the next year, which is massive. Again, if you're familiar with retail leases, oftentimes 5 to 10 year leases. So to have 40% of leases up in the next 12 months is astounding. And for those stores that they deem as being too high in lease rate or they might be in an unfavorable area with low traffic, they're either closing those stores or relocating those stores. The next 12 months for them, this is not a time for them to be complacent in this particular arena. And they mentioned for fiscal 2019, again, this is the final quarter of their last fiscal year, fiscal 2018. So they look for the next 12 months to predict 20 to 30 more closures, 15 to 20 relocations, and 10 to 12 new stores, as well as a few store expansions. As we mentioned earlier, net store growth won't be too negative as they continue to be aggressive and seeking out new markets. If you do the quick math, worst case scenario for them, they close 20 stores in the coming year. No matter what, though, it seems as though lease obligation should decrease noticeably, at least in the short term. Ideally, some of the stickier leases that they want out of are also for the stores that underperform in terms of sales. And it turns out they keep extremely close track and they make public this close track of prior decisions to relocate. And over the last 74 relocations that they've done, the company notes that only eight are underperforming and only four are losing money, which for a retailer, again, a few years ago that was losing money across the chain, that's really remarkable. The worst store among them, only losing 55000 a year, which is not horrible given where they've come from and where they've been. They think that an active hands-on approach is best for their real estate plans. They see higher vacancy rates at select shopping centers as more of an opportunity and I think that really plays into the hand of a lot of off-price retailers at the moment with merchandising, integration of supply chain improvements, and real estate optimization. A lot of good plans there. Management is excited about the upcoming year, the fiscal 2019 year to be exact, although they still see big opportunities to improve. So they're not just resting on their laurels, which is the proper thing to say if you are a competent leadership team. Just the fact that they are profitable is a massive step for them. Remember, there were huge questions in early 2017 after their president and COO, Melissa Phillips, had resigned. One could argue that they are in a stronger position than at any point in the last three years, despite hitting some speed bumps and 
some rough quarterly earnings reports at times during this last year. But this is a company to keep your eye on for the future. I think the stock being up 80% over the past year is really representative of how they're being managed now. And to be honest with you, Trent, this is a retailer that I didn't have much faith in one to two years ago when we first started talking about them on the podcast. But they are really turning the ship around. And I love the fact that they are trying to execute in every division for their company, especially with the real estate. Those lease obligations, extremely expensive. And it's interesting that they understand that those landlords want to keep somebody there in place. And that in some of those shopping centers that they are currently in, those landlords are going to be a little bit more open to negotiation for the long term. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. Well, we've reached the final segment of the Retail Focus Podcast, a segment we call Looking Ahead, where each Leighton and I tell you about one story we're keeping an eye on for the next week, month, or year. We start with Leighton. Mine has to do with bad news, which... I have to talk about since we talked about mostly positive news for the stories for this edition of the podcast, but my story, my looking ahead story has to do with 33 Sears and 13 Kmart locations that are going to be closing by November. This will leave the company with less than 800 stores now. The company at one time, Trent, back in 2010 had over 1,300 Kmart stores alone, so over 2,000 stores for the company and just in a short amount of time just six years they've cut that number by more than one half this story however is not about the recent closures as they often are in the looking ahead segments we talk about what kmarts are closing what sears are closing in particular markets exiting certain markets entirely this is about the long-term viability of the company because s p global market intelligence actually estimated that sears lost 251 million dollars in its second fiscal quarter so if you compare this to their current market value, the value of all of their shares, it's around $110, $120 million. They're actually losing more every quarter than the value of their entire company. But if you look at their balance sheet, Trent, over $400 million of cash. But if they continue losing money at that same level and they are done liquidating the assets that they can sell off at a pretty high valuation, the company doesn't have much more time left, and they have around 400 or roughly $400 million in debt payments that are coming due in the next eight to nine months. And so I think all in all, this is potentially the beginning of the end for Sears. We've been saying it for years. Everybody has been saying it for the last five years. However, the writing is now on the wall. I'm very curious to see what levers they can pull as it comes towards the holiday season. And that's one thing people are saying is, why close these stores now? Why close these stores when we're so close to the holiday season? You want them all closed by the end of November, yet that's exactly when the holiday season begins. So those people that are coming in, making those additional purchases, you will no longer be extracting those particular sales because of the choice to close these roughly three dozen or so stores. It is certainly perplexing, but then again, much about Sears Holdings last five years have been perplexing. I'm going to end on a positive note, though, and we're going to go back to the off-price segment. Ross and TJ Maxx always give their earnings side-by-side side usually, and during Ross's earnings call, they mentioned that they've raised their potential number of stores in the U.S. to 3,000 locations, up from their previous target of 2,500. This was echoed by Chain Store Age as they noted that they expect the company to continue growing, but that's something Ross also mentioned. And here's the key. They mentioned their DD's discount locations. They see a runway to 600 stores right now, just 227 of them, most of them in the South, particularly Leighton. I know you just visited the Houston area not that long ago. Ton of DD's discount stores there, but they see a massive runway. Neil Saunders, one of our favorite retail analysts, if not our favorite retail analyst, said that these expansion targets are feasible, but he mentioned that the execution needs to be on point. He said, and I quote that, as the market is becoming increasingly saturated with off-price retailers, and another thing that Neil mentioned earlier in the week was actually the fact that it might almost be a dangerous thing overall for the retail economy that we're seeing off-price retailers continue to grow, continue to have same-store sales growth, continue to knock their earnings 
out of the park because it suggests that customers are either still looking for very, very good deals or they're being very cautious in how they're spending their money still. I think some benefit certainly comes from the fact that TJX mentioned more millennial shoppers, more Gen Z shoppers, if you will, coming into their stores. And some of those younger millennials and Gen Z groups may not have a lot of money to spend just yet. But the overall point is still salient, I feel like. The fact that we've seen so much growth in off-price, what does happen next time we hit a recession? Do full-price retailers take even more of a hit than some have taken over the past three years? So something to keep an eye out on, but just watch and know that a raw store or a new one may be coming to a location near you over the next three years as they continue their bullish store growth plan. Well, that'll do it for us on the Retail Focus podcast. For Layton, I'm Trent saying so long. A big thanks once again to MyEmma.com for presenting this week's podcast. Check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Retail Podcast. We'll be back a week from now. This has been the Retail Focus podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.